Welcome to this technical walkthrough. Thank you for joining us today as we dive into Silo um, technical site. We're delighted to have the entire team go in the session. Um, they will guide us through the core functionalities of their code base, shedding light on their smart contracts while sharing valuable insights. From the Immunify side, I'm Daniel, and I'll be co-hosting alongside Silo's te technical experts. And without further ado, I'll hand it over um, to you, Volpe, who will lead us through the technical details. OK, so um, show how deep you're going to go. I start the Silo as a blockchain as well to give an introduction. Uh, yes. We'll jump right into the context. OK. Uh, and also, meanwhile, if you can, I don't know if the fifth question was truncated, so if you can complete or if not, let me know. Cool. Uh, so, Celo is currently uh, an L1 uh, blockchain uh, using proof of stake that has been around since 2020 uh, with a decentralized set of 110 independent validators. And currently, the network is transitioning into becoming an L2, um, implementing the OP stack. Some key features of the chain that are imported over are the staking system and the ability to pay gas uh, in certain currencies that are in a enabled list. How that feature is implemented is changing and is part of the audit, but in a nutshell, uh, that feature enables uh, transaction of the tokens without any account uh, abstraction primitive uh, as an extra yeah, parameter in the, the transaction itself. Um, in this audit, it's also included a little protocol built in-house by C-Labs that is called StakeSello. And that protocol is a liquid staking solution for the Celo token. Uh, there's a set of, I think it's eight or seven validators it made it at this point. Um, those uh, are chosen by this protocol and people deposit Celo in this protocol and the protocol automatically votes for those validators and then it's fully liquid and transferable. Um, let's start from the beginning. Today, Celo um, has a proof of stake system. That means that uh, Celo holders can lock their Celo for a minimum of three days. And with that stake um, position, they can do two things. They can participate in governance proposals and vote for yes or no to abstain for proposals, or they can uh, elect for a validator. Um, simultaneously. Uh, if they choose a validator and that validator is within the set, there's an algorithm uh, using a don't election for determining who is in the set and who's not. But if a holder is looking and voting for a certain validator and their votes are activated, uh, they are getting a reward proportional of the uptime performance of that validator in the chain. Um, the Validator is supposed to uh, validate blocks, and they get the fee, and they also get a reward uh, in stable tokens, uh, dollars specifically, at the end of each epoch. An epoch is defined as a 24-hour period. It's defined in blocks. I don't remember the exact numbers. It's one block every five uh, seconds, and that piece is also changing. Uh, historically, a lot of features uh, that Celo implemented were done before Ethereum community was getting modularized. So there was a lot of a specific code that was written. Uh, and it was written in a, in a combination of Geth and Solidity. So the epochs are implemented in Geth, in the Geth line itself. But then uh, some part of the rewards, the voting is implemented in Solidity. This is a combination of gas optimization because things are cheaper to do in, in Geth or, or, or mostly possible in Geth and not in Solidity. But in Solidity, you have the flexi flexibility of uh, changing the contracts without a smart contract. 
So it also has decentralized governance. I mentioned you can vote. Uh, the three things in the, the governance contract. Also, going to say I'm mostly going to focus on the smart contracts. It's called. That's mostly of my expertise and the things I work on uh, daily. Uh, but I can also provide a brief um, background about how it is the, um, the the blockchain itself and what's happening after the transition. Um, so the one of the key pieces that is changing, um, we call it the pop manager. Let me share my screen so that I can have some context. Um, this is it. Yes. Uh, okay. So, as I mentioned, the ePower process in Geth is written in Go, and we have rewritten that to uh, something called Epoch Manager, and I think I'm in the wrong branch. Yes. Um, this must be in your definition of the other, uh, but everything for the smart contracts is in the branch 12. Release, core contract release 12. So one key piece of this transition is this Epoch Manager contract. What this Epoch Manager does, um, can I have Solidity here? No, well, let's put C. Let me see if I get something. Okay. Um, this contract essentially is responsible for now providing rewards and electing validators. This is challenging because there is a big amount of holders and a big amount of validators. So there are a bunch of optimizations that they are done when the epoch is processed. Also, the epoch cannot be guaranteed to last an exact amount of logs because this is done with transactions. Um, that a bot or uh, any AOA can send, and you can never guarantee those transactions are going to land in a particular block. Um, so there are some assumptions there that change. This uh, smart contract, the epoch manager, is the one responsible for closing the epoch, paying out validators, um, paying out the voters for the rewards at the end of the epoch. And this contract has permission to mint. So this and to exchange for a stable token. Um, so it's an important consideration to have. Uh, a key feature that I also mentioned at the beginning that we are changing is the fee currency. Uh, previously, we we're using a contract that is called fee currency directory. And this contract is getting deprecated. There is uh, definition of deprecated, that means that the contracts are still going to remain on chain, but all the public functions are supposed to stop working uh, in DL2. And after the transition, this uh, we're going to use this new contract called, um, sorry, the one that is deprecated is the fee currency whitelist. This is the one that's getting deprecated. And the one that is going to remain is the fee currency directory. This is a generalization where now um, oracles are used, uh, are generic and can be set per token. The gas that this um, transaction, uh, the intrinsic gas that a transaction is still done is also changed and it's not configurable. Um, this smart contract is essentially um, at the center of it. A key uh, thing that was developed, we have this problem that Contracts are deploying on the L1, and then the network transitions to the L2, and there's no opportunity um, to change the contracts in between. We do have a script that performs some migrations uh, in between, and that's also part of the audit, but we would like to remain that script as, as small as possible so that there's less spatial cases if someone is indexing the network from scratch. So we came up with this strategy of deploying the contract release 12 on the L1 before the transition, and the smart contracts know how to behave exactly like they do in the L1 today. And at the moment of the transition, the smart contracts are supposed to automatically realize that they are in the L2 and change behavior or even deprecate the behavior 
in the chase in the cases that are uh, required. Um, this is done in this smart contract. It's fairly simple, but it's a critical piece that uh, can compromise um, if done wrong. So worth taking a look here. Um, okay, so uh, now I want to explain a little bit what's going to happen on the transition. So the challenge on the transition is that the blocks that we have on the other one today are not compatible with the blocks that mainnet, uh, I think mainnet has, or even the OP stack have, because uh, this custom transactions field that I explained, and we also have like some live syncing protocol that includes extra headers. So it's not possible to have the old blocks and the new blocks in the same chain. So we need to have a migration script, and this migration script is similar to what OP did in the Bedrock uh, update. Um, that essentially what happens is that we have a script that outputs the status uh, of the L1. That means that every contract and every account is going to remain unchanged. Adds the optimism pre-compiles uh, that they are deployed to a specific addresses um, to all the chains and performs a couple of miscellaneous transactions. And with that, we land with a state root. That state root is going to be the genesis of the cell two network. Um, and after that, it, people are supposed to run that uh, script independently and come up with the same genesis block. And that genesis block, uh, people will start the nodes. And from there, the cell network um, is going to start. If, this, if people have different genesis nodes, then that means that their nodes are not going to sync because uh, the blocks are not going to be valid. Um, and that is where the, the script uh, comes into play. Then we have this uh, cell 2 is implemented a data availability layer. Uh, it's implemented IDNDA, which is um, relatively novel as far as I know, and it's going to sink costs drastically for the chain uh, in able to support uh, the use cases that we want to support, uh, specifically on payments and micropayments. Um, and then what the data availability layer will do is eventually post that to Ethereum and there's so finality and it's very similar to OP, but with the extra layer of uh, a data availability layer aggregating um, that information. In what else? Um, is there uh, any piece that I am forgetting from the list? I don't have it with me in, in my computer. Uh, I don't know, remember if it was you, Beno, or Nico that were that had that list with you, or I think the audit scope. Yes. Um, so you covered OP get. Mm -hmm. Well, OP get. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Good. App chains apps. Mm -hmm. And anything else? Uh, nope. I think that's it. Okay. Well, OP geth is the OP the, the geth the OP take of geth that they forked. We have our own fork of this uh, that includes. Uh, we'll start able to find it. Oh, there we go. Um, that includes these special features uh, that we have. Mm, this is the code of the network itself. It's going to start from um, the, the validators. The concept of validator is going to remain on chain and rewards are going to keep distributed. But the 
likely not going to take the role of validators anymore in the L2, and they are will temporarily be decentralized RPC providers up until the point the technology is ready to come up with a decentralized sequencer. And when a decentralized sequencer um, comes, then we have all the setups because the slots and the, the election is uh, already in place. So this OP geth it's not going to be run by the set of validators in DL2, but it's uh, going to be run by a sequencer. Uh, we also like to get uh, fault proofs uh, at the time of mainnet deploy. So this essentially is the critical code uh, for having the chain um, running safely. I now also would like to dive a little deeper into StakeCello. The diff of StakeCello is relatively small. One is a, a known issue, uh, and we believe that fixes are like relatively simple, uh, but they should be taken with caution. Uh, it's a complex code base that allows quite a lot of freedom to the holder to elect what they want to do with their session. And that comes with a lot of accounting challenges and edge cases that may arise. Uh, so it might be worth taking a deep look at how that accounting is done and trying to create uh, where all the edge cases um, that may arise. And coming from this, I guess I have a couple of questions here written down. Um, the first one is if we have seen any expected bugs in the boss audits and how they affect the security as solution for threat models. We have seen a couple of bugs, some before mainnet deployment and a very few on, on mainnet as well. I uh, think the first thing we encountered was the uh, not by one issue where validators that were staking the minimum 10K were not getting rewards. Uh, and they should have, and there was like a minus and equal that was supposed to be, and it was just like strictly minus. Uh, before the audit, I remember someone had forgotten a check um, that uh, some re small reward uh, could be only reset by a certain permission account. But other than that, we haven't really seen much in production. There is a stakes of known issue that does not lead to uh, loss of funds and it's actually recoverable without any code modifications. So knocking on wood uh, have been being very safe on that end. We have received in the art, uh, in the audits, I don't think we have received uh, criticals. We in the audits were detected uh, some concept that we handled, um, or I remember exactly. Uh, but there was some issue uh, that I don't remember, but it didn't really change this as assumptions and security model. It was just like some arithmetic uh, problem that then it got resolved and tested. Um, the threat model, Celo does not rely much on external functionalities. Uh, like oracles, the gas currency feature does depend on oracles, uh, but there's been discussions in the forum in the past about what happens if either the oracles are off or the actual price of the oracle, the tokens is extremely volatile. And we have been, there have been explored like extreme scenarios in both cases, they go up or they go down and damage is minimal and actually there are safeguards that are not part of the protocol, but are part of the configurations that the validators uh, have. And the impact is very insignificant in even an extreme example. Um, as the protocol doesn't, it's relatively simple as being meant to be simple. I'm talking about uh, cello code, not necessarily um, the stick cello. So there are some economic assumptions that are actually going away as the validator set is uh, temporarily uh, deprecated. Uh, the whole proof of stake 
protocol is meant to have a lot of uh, value back, to, back in the validators and they would not be incentivized to misbehave. Now it's actually getting ported over to Ethereum mainnet. So there's no, uh, that's the advantage of being an L2, the security is inherited uh, from the L1. So we don't really have uh, much to worry about from that end. And I would say chances of an error are likely um, some requirement uh, that is not being fulfilled. And there's not a lot of composability what we can do with the central contracts. So uh, I will full focus more on what you can actually do, uh, try to trick um, some numbers. Um, for which areas should Bot Hunters prioritize in the code base IY? Well, as I mentioned earlier, SXLO, it's a good uh, place to take a look. It's not necessarily a critical part of the protocol because it's a protocol that is built on top, but it's significant in the chain. Uh, so we would like to keep that safe. Um, I mentioned the L2 check, that is a critical piece. I mentioned the Epoch Manager. Particularly, the Epoch Manager uh, has the limit end that it, the transactions that it performs has to be available in a block. So the transaction is actually split in two transactions that are meant supposed to fit in a block, but if they don't, there is um, one call that can be done step by step, essentially providing rewards to one validator at the time in each step. And it should be checked that that function cannot be tricked and nobody can be duplicated and everything can be performed in the, in the right time and rewards are landed in the right accounts. So this contract can can meant, uh, so it should be be very careful. Oh, there's something that I also mentioned forgot to mention at the time of transition is that today the solo token exists purely on the L2. It's a token within the solo chain. At the moment of the transition, the source of truth is gonna change because now Celo has a hard cap of one billion. Uh, and it's minted on demand on every epoch on the L2. But now that's conceptually going to change and Celo is going to be fully minted on the Ethereum chain and the 1 billion hard cap are going to be provided to the bridge. And the bridge at the time of the transition is going to have the balance. So all the accounts that live on the L2 can have the token that is actually backed by the token in the L1 and people can go and claim their token in the L1 as well. And that means that uh, you cannot mean Celo anymore on the L2, you can just release it. And we created a one contract that's called Celo and Release Treasury where all the pre-minted uh, tokens land and as the epochs go by, there's a contract called Epoch Rewards and those Epoch Rewards Tell us how much are you supposed to mint. Uh, that logic is also a little critical because it's part of the token itself, so it should be uh, handled with care. Um, and of course, people can redeem their tokens on the on the other one as well. Don't know if I mentioned that already. Um, oh, there's also important. Celo has the Celo token. Uh, something that we call duality. This already existed on DL1 and OP stack now has a feature for this in DL2 that I think we might be the first people using it and it should be part of this audit. Um, that feature is that the token that we have, the Celo token, is both what ETH is for Ethereum, the native token, as well as an RC20 token. So essentially it's a token wrapping the native asset. Uh, this works quite fine with the extension of transfers uh, because you cannot do this on Ethereum uh, because a smart contract cannot transfer ETH on behalf of someone else, that would be catastrophic. So we created this uh, transfer precompile that essentially the blockchain checks that this transfer precompile is only called by the Celo token contract and this transfer pick compile, if so, enables the, the transfer. 
back in the day, this was the same precompile that was used to mint. So essentially transferring from the serial address was a mint. Uh, that was incompatible from the, the, o, the OP stack and also has some undesirable properties. So that could modify and the transfer precompile can not only transfer. Uh, and I think, I don't know if it is upstream or we are supposed to put it upstream, but there's like some integration there that we want to have available for the, the super chain. And this pre-compile is important, right? Because this is the transfer of the native token. And if you can gain this in, a, in any way, then uh, that could lead to challenges. Um, and I think those are the, the areas I'll, I'll prioritize. Uh, do you have any tips or best practice for finding uh, vulnerabilities in your system? So we do have an extensive uh, library of tests that they have been recently um, migrated to Solidity, uh, to Foundry. So I will start from there particularly. So a lot of contracts are highly coupled between each other, uh, not because they're calling each other all the time, but because they need information from one another. Uh, and they, in the we have integration tests, but in the unit test, they are mocked because it's very difficult to us uh, have everything in the perfect status at the time of um, wanting to test something. Uh, so if one, one strategy would be try to go to the test and try to see where mocks are getting used and then try to see if behavior will be different um, in case, um, a real implementation was used. Mocks are also extensively used because Celo had a lot of pre-compiles and those pre-compiles were used for the for epoch management and voting and a bunch of stuff that take a lot of gas. All that went away, uh, but not necessarily all tests were rebuilt uh, with actual implementations. Uh, previously, it was very difficult uh, to test because at the beginning we used uh, Truffle and Truffle um, supported the pre-compiles, but not exactly, and then we migrate to Foundry, and Madrid does support pre-compass, but they are written in Solidity, uh, so that doesn't necessarily guarantee it's going to be the same behavior. So they would also claim that the mocks themselves are um, sorry, the pre-compass themselves were mocked. So now it's it should be possible to test much more purely in Solidity um, and see if there's any particular test that would be interesting to have and see if actually possible to cause uh, behavior. Um, I will jump on to the fifth question that is, can you elaborate on various access controls and rollback uh, within the, the code base? Uh, so Celo um, doesn't really have much um, privileged roles. Uh, most contracts, if not all, uh, Celo contracts are owned by the Celo governance. And Celo governance has a one week long process to change um, implementations. This smart contract is the owner, so it can call uh, functions to set parameters in the contracts and can also go to the proxies and set the implementations. Um, gaming this would be um, a problem. We also have a hotfix solution that in DL2 is, uh, sorry, in DL1 is handled by validators. So the validators can pass a hotfix. And in DL2, uh, it's owned uh, by a committee. And that changed. And remember that the hotfix should remain uh, working until the cell two transitions, but it's the same code race. So it's important to check that everything's working as expected in DL2 and everything's expect working as expected in DL1, and it is not gameable in any way. Uh, and there, the system does have a, a couple of multi six, but they are like highly isolated. Like some people have requested funds and they have approved a certain multi six. Uh, we have a carbon fund that gets uh, rewards automatically every day, actually by the Epoch Rewards uh, contract. Uh, and they give some funds and the multi-sig owns those funds, but 
you know, that's fairly isolated because they don't really have a special permission. They just manage funds as an, an EOA. Uh, in the cell two, we are inheriting some security assumptions from Optimism in the sense that Optimism have its own contracts and their contracts have the proxy admin and that proxy admin uh, has permissions to set uh, parameters and implementations on DL1 as well on certain contracts on DL2. We are not using the OP fee vaults, by the way, uh, because they only support native ETH and we have tokens in multiple assets. Uh, so the contracts are there, but they are not used. We have something called fee handler instead, but that's uh, another topic. So we have the security committee that's still not formed um, that owns these contracts, not all. I think all on DL1, but not all in DL2 because the set of core contracts that are now exist in DL1 uh, will remain uh, still owned by set of governance. And those are pretty much all the permesse roles. Uh, the validators, a smart contract has uh, permission to mint uh, in the mental contracts. Uh, that's how we get historically stable to distribute to the validators. The epoch manager contract is now the one who does this main, so that code is proxied uh, through validators. Uh, it's quite vanilla, uh, but yeah, making sure that those permissions are set correctly, it's okay. And validators may have some special roles somewhere. We have a slashing contract. Uh, the validators are not the owner, but it affects the, um, the, the balance and the slashing contract has permission to take locked sell off from accounts. Um, but this contract is highly isolated, it's relatively simple contracts. So the, there was a downtime slasher that got deprecated because now we're not going to have downtime anymore. And now we have a governance slasher that it might be a committee or governance itself performing the slash. Um, and that and it has, needs to be handled with care because uh, you can slash an account for as much as you want if you are not careful. Um, what resources would you recommend for understanding your project and its code device in depth? Well, we have, uh, let me share my screen to show where you can find this information. If we go to Solomon Repo, Solomon Repo is where everything used to live other than the solution itself, uh, get. Uh, and a bunch of things have moved out, but the contracts remain here. We have these release tags, and they are all tagged in a predictable way. It's not showing me the tag, but here it is. Uh, it's tagged in this version like this. Uh, Baklava is a test, and Alpha is a test, and the one that doesn't have anything is painted. If you go to these tags, you are going to find the change log. And you're also going to find the audits. Sometimes it's attached, sometimes it's a link. And you have this for the 11 releases that we've done so far. I think the first one ever uh, it was actually a split in three. Uh, I think it's in this uh, URL. Yes, here we have everything. Uh, you can go in chronological order and then uh, analyze every single change that we have done. This is also true for state cello. Uh, if you go here, uh, you're going to find the audits and the tags. I think it's more in the forum than in GitHub, but you should be able to find it if you look for it. If not, please do let me know. Um, and then, of course, we have the, about the release process of the contracts. Uh, we have this documentation here. Uh, you can go for this quick, quite easily. Actually, I think you should put smart contract release process on Google is the first result. And here we explain uh, the versioning that we are using, uh, how do we actually perform the releases, how we verify the releases, uh, how we verify uh, backward compatibility, 
on how the proposal is actually executed and how do we verify that it was executed um, correctly. Um, and those will be resources uh, for sure. Uh, look, we also have this uh, specs.settle.org uh, where you can, and are you seeing my, yes, you're seeing my search bar. Uh, where here we have a highlight of like key changes and a lot of concepts that are mentioned here are because they are changing uh, either because they're deprecated or because they live on the L, in the L2. So everything that's mentioned here is worth uh, all this understanding and taking a look. And with that, sorry about that. Uh, with that, I think. I covered most of the things I wanted to cover. I don't know if there's uh, any question. Thanks, Martin. Actually, there are two more questions that I'm going to just uh, paste here. Uh, awesome. There are two more questions, as I was saying, Martin uh, left in the technical walkthrough script. And those are related to areas where you think that there might be potential for most bugs due to complexity involved in the implementation and the other one is related to known issues yeah um so known issues uh there's one for stake settle that i don't have the link handy but you can look in the forum it's called a stake settle auditing issue in forum.solo.org and that is a pull request that states uh, here we are uh, trying to fix. That fixes relatively easily. Other than that, we don't really have known issues in production. We do have limitations. As I said, uh, there are a lot of gas optimizations so that we can distribute rewards at the end of every epoch. Uh, so there are uh, scenarios where there's like one way accounting error because people have a pool of units and then one group of people have a pool of units and another have a, a, a pool of units and then the total zero that they have is like the total zero of the contract divided by the units that they have. So when they want to distribute uh, rewards to everybody, which is like increase units to their pool and not send transactions to them all. Um, this has a limit, a, somewhat a limitation that, for example, you can get an event for each account getting a reward, uh, but it's very efficient. But it also has a problem that depending on the amount of sellers, some people might be off on zero and one weight. We have looked into this and it's orders of magnitudes more expensive to game this, but then actually let it be uh because you can only gain one way and a transaction gas is going to take you a lot more than that but it's a little bit annoying that even if you don't see any transaction from your one account you could see a scenarios where the balance actually does change and that could lead uh to some inconsistency not handled correctly but we have had systems running production with this, and other than a couple of false alerts, haven't been uh, much of an issue. Um, I think, well, the bridging is handled by OP, and those contracts are well known, uh, but that is worth taking a look if there's some in unexpected interaction between the bridge uh, and us. Um, and then in the gas currency features, so that touches the state of get. Um, it's executing custom code in between transactions. And we have debugged a couple of issues in there that we have seen in our testnet. We believe that we have found them all, but we're taking a look. Um, and the last one is about not issues. Um, so I think I already mentioned that one and I can look for this forum post. Uh, I remember exactly the details uh, right now. Uh, forum. Uh, here it is. 
Essentially, here it is. I can, I'm gonna share this link in chat. Um, uh, so that we have a link, but this issue is recoverable. It's an accounting issue. Um, and there are ways uh, to walk around it. Um, and so far we have never had a phone at risk. And that's it. Uh, worth mentioning, Celo had a, <clears throat> an install, uh, I think three years ago, because there was a message that was getting too big uh, because Celo has quite a big uh, gas limit in the blocks. So that might be a little bit of a special situation uh, that needs to be handled. Um, but uh, as far as we know, there's no issue in production that I can highlight. All right. Thank you very much, Martin. I think that pretty much covers everything. Um, the session was packed with valuable insight, technical details, a fantastic opportunity for everyone um, curious to know about Zillow. Um, for everyone watching and with follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to Zillow team. They're more than happy to assist you via the designating Discord channel. And lastly, a quick reminder, Zillow is currently hosting an audit competition on Immunify a unique event with $50,000 reward pool up for grabs, and you have time till December the 6th. For more details, visit immunify.com slash explore and check out the Silo um, audit competition program. So don't hesitate to reach out to Silo team or Immunify on Discord for any clarification. Thank you again and happy hunting.